Um, you've been involved in, in so many creative fields over the years. If you're asked to put down your occupation on a formal document, what, what do you put? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I generally put uh, musician uh, because it's uh, easiest uh, to uh, understand, but I tend to think of it more as a kind of extended form of journalism. E- even the music is a kind of reporting on the culture around me. Uh, so while I think of myself as kind of a journalist, I, I generally write down musician. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your early developing years as a musician, and at what point did it become apparent to you that uh, a full-time career in music was uh, a viable proposition? Well, I had no intention of uh, becoming a professional musician. Um, as, and as a matter of fact, in the 60s, when we were college students, when my friends Steve Miller and Boz Skaggs went off uh, to become musicians, I decided specifically not to do that and to go to graduate school thinking that I would be a teacher. Uh, so it was really a coincidence. I was in England in, in the late 60s uh, going to graduate school at Sussex University, and Steve and Boz came over to make their first recording there. And uh, I hung out in the studio with them and, and worked on the record, and so that gave me a taste of the business. And then two years later, uh, when I had graduated and uh, I was thinking I would start teaching, um, I sent out uh, a lot of applications and, and nothing interesting came back. And having written some songs for Steve by that point, um, having um, stopped playing piano entirely for almost uh, six months thinking I was done, and then picking it up again just because uh, I needed to have it in my life. Um, I decided uh, with my wife to move to Los Angeles and get in the record business. I'm not quite sure what drove that decision. I think it was just the fact that I had completed the academics. Uh, it had kind of run its course, and uh, music was all around me. It's just the, everybody I knew was a musician, and everybody was talking about music. and. The, so that's what I did. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles and decided, as I told people at the time, uh, you know, my dissertation was on the sociology of black music in America. And I told people at the time, well, I've decided to stop studying the information and become the information. <laughs> You, as you mentioned, you, you worked with, with Steve Miller and Boz Skaggs in those very early days, a band called the Ardells. Uh, was it apparent to you when you were working with them that, that they had what it took to, to go on to, to the careers that they did have? Well, back then, there were no careers to go on to. I mean, we're talking about 1961, 1962. It really hadn't dawned on me that there was any way a, a middle-class white boy could become a, a professional musician because back then most of the uh, professional performers were older, were uh, kind of Vegas type or, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it wasn't until the, the Beatles really took hold that it became obvious. And Bob Dylan, hmm. clearly Bob Dylan that it became obvious to some people that this was a career path. It was clearly obvious to Steve when he heard the Paul Butterfield band. Um, At the time, we were living about an hour and a half north of Chicago, and Steve just started going down to Chicago all the time. I remember one time he came back from Chicago, and he he just crashed at my house, and he just kept talking about the scene down there and, and, and how great it was. But Paul Butterfield uh, was already uh, recording so I would say, um, even though I knew how good they were, I didn't realize how good they were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I spent uh, a year or so uh, listening, and there was a third uh, guitar player in that band. Well, Boz was playing bass, Steve was playing guitar, and there was a third uh, guitar player, a guy named Denny, Denny Berg, who was every bit as good as Steve and Boz. He went on to go into the advertising business. But the three of them sang three-part harmony so beautifully. I I guess I was just naive. I just thought that a lot of people had that ability. I I didn't realize it, uh, how 
unusual it was. Um, but a few years later, it was clear that Steve and Boz had put in a lot of work and had uh, become uh, professionals. Uh, but I don't think I had a sense of that until the end of the 60s. So when you were starting to, to develop your own tastes in, in music, who were the first songwriters and musicians that, that really inspired you to want to make your own music? Well, necessity inspired me to make my own music. I mean, I grew up as a kid listening uh, mostly to uh, Frank Sinatra and jazz, Horace Silver and uh, Lambert Hendricks and Ross and piano players like George Shearing and... Uh, Oh, uh, Horace Silver and Dave Brubeck, and uh, it was kind of eclectic. It really wasn't pop music as such. Um, and the first song I ever wrote was in response to working with the Steve Miller Band in the studio and seeing how songs were put together. Uh, it was called Midnight Tango, something I wrote for Steve. Um, but I was uh, more influenced by instrumentalists and jazz singers than I was by pop artists. Mm. But clearly, two uh, musicians sent me down the road. One was Bob Dylan, uh, because like so many people at the time, uh, he really represented something that hadn't existed before, and that is this kind of a sense of authenticity. Um, the voice, the sound of his voice alone you know, launched the entire punk movement, I think. It, it, it made people who had just had kind of an interesting voice or a normal voice able to sing professionally as long as they had conviction. And the other one was Mose Allison, uh, who I loved as a piano player and a songwriter. And if anybody gave me the sense that it's possible to write a simple so uh, song that sounds simple in a blues or a pop idiom that actually has very sophisticated... Uh, lyrics and a sophisticated premise, it was Mose Allison. So I guess the short answer to your question is Bob Dylan and Mose Allison really set me on my way. Yeah. Talk about some of the, the session work that you did in England with uh, Glenn Johns and uh, some of the more memorable sessions you might have worked on there and, and how do you look back on that period in terms of your grounding as a musician? Well, being in the studio with Glenn really gave me confidence in the studio because I had played a lot with various musicians by the end of the 60s, uh, but being in a recording studio is an entirely different animal. And, um, I mean, at the time, uh, we were, uh, Glenn always worked at Olympic Studios, and Olympic uh, was the place where he recorded The Who and The Stones and a lot of the groups. And so... I spent uh, time there when Steve Miller and Boz were there recording, but then after they left and returned to the States, I would spend time there. Uh, occasionally, Glenn would call me up and have me come and play uh, a session. Or occasionally, I would just meet uh, musicians there. I, that's how I met uh, Peter Frampton. It's how I met uh, Eric Clapton. It's um, how I got involved with uh, a bass player named Greg Ridley. Uh, who was at the time working with a band called Spooky Tooth. And uh, I think it was a guy named Mike Kelly. He might have been the drummer. It's been so long. But they uh, were reformulating, and uh, there was some time where they were talking to me about joining the band and becoming part of it. But I really didn't... I, I wasn't able to do that. I was in graduate school, and I was pretty much committed to it. But what I remember about those times is people just sitting around and playing music and talking to each other about music and playing music for each other and bringing records in and talking about stuff. It was very informal. Uh, it was very music-oriented. It wasn't business-oriented as such. It was all about the music. Today, it really is all about the business. So it was a totally different experience than you can get today. Um, but the main uh, grounding for me came from watching Glenn work. Uh, because Glenn was very clear about what he wanted uh, as a producer, and he was able to express it to musicians. And even though he, w at the time, was already an excellent engineer, it wasn't his engineering skills that made him a producer. It was his people skills and his musical uh, understanding. So watching him work uh, really 
taught me about record production and gave me the sense that I could do it. I believe uh, he also had a hand in you getting your first uh, recording deal, too. Yes, yeah, well, in, in a roundabout way. I mean, I, we were in Los Angeles by this time in 1971, and he and I actually shared a house in Hollywood. I mean, he was still living in, in uh, England, but he would come to L.A., oh, I don't know, five, six times a year. So we rented a house together so he'd have a place to stay when he came. And um, I was out there trying to get a record deal. I had already worked with Steve and Boz and everybody, but, you know, I was very into jazz, and uh, I was not a pop singer, so it was not obvious. Even though Glenn had done some demos with me, he produced... Um, a series of demos with me uh, when we were still in England with uh, oh, Charlie Watts was the drummer and Greg Ridley and Pete Frampton and a bunch of uh, British musicians. So I had some good demos, uh, and Glenn had a hand in those for sure. But I spent like six months in L.A. just knocking on doors and calling people. I didn't have a manager, and I didn't want to make a pop record as such like Steve was making although I was working with Steve at the time, and I probably had already written Space Cowboy with him and some of the other things. Um, but literally, he helped me get the deal by one day. I met him at Capitol Records, and we were going into the studio to see some people. We wound up going upstairs to the executive floors and talking to the guy who was the president at the time, Art Mogul. And uh, we wound up going out to lunch with Artie, and, um, well... It just uh, put me on the map. It put me on Artie Mogul's radar, and uh, within two weeks I had a record deal. Mm. So I, I definitely attribute that to Glenn. So you've spent some time in England, spent some time in L.A., but for the best part of your career you, you've been based there in Madison, away from the, the main music capitals. Has, has having a, a settled home base helped you uh, creatively? Well, I'm pretty sure it's defined me creatively. You know, the uh, the... Looking back at, at what it might have been like had I stayed in Los Angeles, had I gone to New York, it would have been an entirely, entirely different uh, experience. By being in a, in a small, quiet, Midwestern town, it's given me the opportunity and at the same time forced me to invent not only myself, but a lot of the work that I did. Uh, I had to keep busy. I had to stay alive. I had to rely on my own ideas and believe in them you know it's one thing to have a good idea it's another thing to go out and try to execute it and uh, because i was not working uh in a large market where there were a lot of people doing what i was doing uh i have to say that i've been pretty much left uh, to my own devices for 40 some years and i think that the work i've done is a result of that yeah Outside of music, you've maintained a successful career in the media with both radio and television projects. Has there ever been a, a dilemma for you to uh, balance your attentions towards all these different facets of, of your career? You know, as I said, uh, when we started, it's all a form of journalism to me. They're all opportunities, and and they're all in the music. I mean, it all. I'm very... Uh, I'm very much a, an ongoing student, you know. I love learning, and I love new chances to put things together in a new way. And whether I'm talking to a musician or trying to, to work in the studio or writing something about uh, music or a musician, it, it is of a piece to me. It doesn't seem to be separate. And for every, you know, piece of work of mine that's out there, there's eight or nine that I tried to do that failed. So a lot of uh, people might look at it and say, wow, it's just one success after another. No, it really isn't. I mean, every year that I made a record or two records or wrote something, there are a bunch of things I tried to do, and, and they failed. Uh, TV series, radio series, whatever, writing. So um, it's just been an ongoing process, and some of it has survived, and, and a lot of it hasn't. Has uh, having a media a media career yourself uh, influenced the way you deal with the media in your role as a musician? Well, I think the way people deal with the media is more a function of their personalities. I don't. I mean, I, I suppose at the top level, when you get to uh, media manipulation, like big pop stars, Lady Gaga, or whatever, you. Uh, you rely on the science of manipulating the media or dealing with the media. But, you know, 
Van Morrison is Van Morrison. That's just him. Mm -hmm. And how he appears in the media or in the studio, that's just who he is. And uh, that's his personality. So I think that uh, the one thing I did learn from all the interviews I did with musicians, there is something I learned, and it's very simple. And it sounds trite, but it's very uh, much at the heart of this business, and that is be yourself. You just have the courage to be yourself, like what you like, believe what you believe, don't let anybody dissuade you from what you think is important, because nobody knows what you're about better than you do. And you know when we start out, we're trying to be our heroes, and we're trying to change ourselves in some profound way. And everybody goes through that, and of course everybody fails. You can't change yourself. You're ultimately who you are, and you have to accept that. And whether it was Miles Davis or Art Blakey or Sonny Rollins or anybody, uh, Mick Jagger, it doesn't matter. The, the first and the most important step is to uh, listen to the voice in your own head and trust it. Mm, great advice. You mentioned Mose Ellison before, and um, reading many articles and reviews on your work over the years, uh, quite often the Mose Ellison uh, comparison will, will, will bob up in the, in the review, and I'm sure there are many worse things to be compared to than, than Mose Ellison, but it, it does it annoy you at times that writers feel the need to, to find comparisons to describe your music? You know, I, I'm, I'm not annoyed by it. You know, I think that the hardest thing to do is put, uh, if you're a writer or a critic, is to put something in context. And so uh, to do that, you go to the easiest things first. And the easiest thing is Mose Allison for me. I mean, we have, first of all, my voice has a similar uh, timbre. I mean, just the sound of my voice is not dissimilar. That's nothing I did, but it, it's, it, it's a fact. And the mm -hmm. second thing is... I was. I have been a great admirer of his, and uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to say that at this point I've worked with him, I consider uh, him a friend of mine, and I'm very proud of that. And um, He was very important in my life, uh, so I, I can't possibly be annoyed by showing up in the same sentence with Mose Allison. At the same time, I think in part because I've kind of gone off on my own path for so long, it is difficult for people to say w what I am. It's very easy to say what I'm not. It's hard to say what I am. I mean, I'm much more influenced uh, by rhythm and blues, I think, than people realize. A lot of the stuff I do is very groove-oriented. That comes from just being totally interested and obsessed with rhythm and blues uh, when I was young. And I always thought that the ultimate would be to put you know, Pharaoh Sanders with James Brown. And back in the 60s and 70s, we were trying to do that. Uh, of course, now that's, that's an idea that's kind of passe, but it's these other influences that are probably more defining in terms of what I ultimately came up with. But, again, to answer your question briefly... I'm never annoyed by have seeing my name associated with Mose Allison, and I'm very proud that this person who was very important in my life uh, became uh, a friend. Uh, you got to produce him at one stage, and you also worked on a, a tribute album with uh, Van Morrison, uh, a tribute to Mose Allison. Tell us about those projects and what they meant to you. Well, in the 80s, uh, Bruce Lundvall, who was running Blue Note Records, gave me the opportunity to produce Moe's uh, for Blue Note. Uh, I think we made six or seven records over the years uh, together. And producing a Moe's Allison record is not like producing a Van Morrison. Well, it actually, it is like producing a Van Morrison record. It's not like producing a Steve Miller record, let's say, or a Diana Ross record or uh, whatever, because uh, Moe's knows exactly what he wants to do. He has a body of uh, songs ready to record. Uh, you have a conversation about uh, kind of who, what, when, and where, you know, what the musicians uh, he's thinking of, uh, what city, uh, what time he's available, and then you just go about putting it together. You have a minimal amount of money to do this with because he doesn't sell records, so the record company never invests large amounts in the project, so you have to find a way to make it happen very quickly. Uh, everybody makes just 
scale, nobody gets paid particularly what they're worth, and you go in and uh, everybody is in this little time capsule for a couple, three days, and that's a Mose Allison record. It's, uh, from my point of view, the work involved in producing Mose all happened before we got into the studio. It was those conversations, picking the musicians, making sure that the music is in order, all that stuff. Once we're in the studios, it's a matter of sitting there and listening to the takes, making sure, for example, he tends to sing along while he solos. So my job was always to mute the vocal mic, you know, so that nothing would come in, to, uh, it would leak in, because a lot of times we recorded direct to two track. Uh, you know, s- simple things like that. It's, it's more peculiar to doing a Mose session or a jazz session. Mm. Uh, interestingly enough, the Van Morrison sessions were very similar. You know, he wanted to do this tribute to Mose. He had asked Georgie Fame and myself to each come up with three or four songs that we wanted to sing as a tribute to Mose, songs that were from really his past more than his current work, uh, because, you know, he doesn't do those old songs anymore. So having produced so much material with Mose, I showed up at the sessions with like 15 songs because I couldn't make the list shorter. And just and I had the lead sheets, and I also had spent so much time with Mose in the studio, I knew exactly how he put the songs together. So I showed up with this music, and Georgie and Van looked at it and said, well, let's just do these songs. So we wound up in a period of three days, uh, literally just going into the room, and Van would say, uh, Van, you sing this one. Georgie, you sing this one. We'll sing this one. And doing the arrangements uh, pretty much as, as, as Mose had conceived them, with a little more backbeat, you know, Mose doesn't like to use a backbeat. He he doesn't like the he can he likes to call what he does mixing up the boogie with the do si do, which means <laughs> boogie woogie in country music. That's how he sees himself. And the backbeat is really an R and B thing, and Mose is not from there. But of course, every we all are. We love the backbeat. So the way we did his songs uh, was much more in a backbeat fashion. But that's how those sessions came down. Yeah, I guess uh, working in your, in the role as a producer for yourself, also being a musician, it must must be a huge advantage in in terms of uh, understanding the needs of the artist. Well, yeah, I think it is, and I think it's also uh, an advantage uh, doing interviews and and journalism as well. I mean, it's kind it kind of demystifies it. There's there's just a a series of normal events that take place in making a record or in setting up an interview and doing it as you well know and it it's what tends to happen is that in order to um, whether you're selling the fan on an article in a magazine or whether you're selling the president of a record company on a production idea you're in the process of trying to make something larger than life but for the musician, it is life. This is their life. There's nothing larger. So it's walking that line between understanding that for the musician, it's just a normal day, and yet for the people who are either going to pay for it or market it, it needs to be something other than just another day. And uh, I think that if, if there is something I've gained from being a player and uh, working in production, it's that. Mm. Speaking of interviews, you released a, a massive project a few years ago, a, a big box set of, of uh, your interviews with many jazz greats. This must have been a real labor of love for you to put together. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It took years to do it, uh, just collecting it and editing it and designing it. And Again, you know, it's one of the things that I really believe in is that if you have an idea and you think it's a good idea and it's important to you, you're you're obligated to go and execute that idea. And... In my case, it often involves, you know, uh, risking not just a lot of time but money as well. You know, a lot of the projects that I've loved over the years and I've done are projects that other people, I tried to sell it to them and they wouldn't buy it. So it was either drop the project or find a way to pay for it myself. And I, every time I've chosen the latter, um, it's worked out fine. It, it's always been profitable, and in the end, I learned a lot. And that box set was exactly like that. Um, I tried <laughs> over 
a period of years to partner up with people who had who had uh, you know more assets than I had, and I couldn't do it. I wound up doing it myself. It took years. It cost money, and it worked out just fine. So, mm. is there another pet project within you like that that you've kept to yourself so far that you'd still like to get out there? Well, I'm just finishing it, and I don't know if after this one. This one's taken seven years. Uh, I don't know if after this I have this strength to do another <laughs> huge one. Uh, but this is uh, it's a book called uh, Jews, Music, and the American Dream, and it's a history of Jews and popular music in America from Irving Berlin all the way up to the Beastie Boys and Rick Rubin. It's the 20th century from a Jewish perspective, including uh, the executives like Clive Davis and the writers like Lieber and Stoller and the record company owners like, uh, oh, you know, Jerry Wexler, Alfred Lyon, and um, all the musicians, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, the writers, the composers, Gershwin, Harold Arlen, and it's also got a first chapter that traces the integration of music into uh, liturgy in the Jewish tradition. Um, all the uh, the Jewish music originally was liturgical music, and all uh, stories, all narrative in the Jewish tradition was sung. It was musical. So um, I taught this course at the University of Wisconsin in nineteen no in uh, two thousand and three. I kind of invented the course, and in the process of teaching the course, I discovered that there wasn't a single book that covered all of this. So I thought, well, maybe I could just transcribe my lectures and get a book. Well, of course, that didn't work, and so I was thrown back on my resources, and it's taken since 2003, uh, but this book will come out next spring, in the spring of uh, 2012. And uh, it's finished, it's completed, and again, you know, it's uh, writing the book or making the record for me is, is really just the beginning, it's not the end. Uh, because, you know, the book business right now is very much like the music business, it doesn't exist. So I decided, well, I can do this, I'm going to have the book designed, I'm going to, I have run my own record labels for years, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a book company. So I had to invent. I had to invent a book company, um, but it's coming together. And uh, like the Talking Jazz box set or any of these projects, I have complete faith that it'll be successful. And success for me is defined uh, this way: there are probably ten thousand people in the world that really should hear what I'm doing or read what I'm writing or whatever. It's not a huge group. Uh, Sometimes I sell more than that for various reasons. Sometimes I sell less than that for various reasons. But my goal is always to get my work into the hands of the 10,000 people who should have it. And uh, so that's my goal for this, and uh, we'll see what happens. And speaking of great Jewish musicians, you recently put out a, a CD of Bob Dylan covers. Uh, I did. Many arrangements are, are fascinating and different to, to, to Dylan's originals. So how great a challenge, challenge was it for you to take on some of these songs, which many would see as sacred songs, and, and turn them around? Well, yeah. Uh, it, it obviously took a long time because I listened to Bob Dylan records when they came out the first time, and yet it was 40 years later before I even tried to do one in public. What happened was I, I, I was um, in uh, in Europe. I, I was touring in France and Spain with a band and playing in clubs. And I started playing subterranean homesick blues because it was fun to play, and the audience really liked it. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know. Uh, and I realized it was because the song was somewhat familiar. And at the same time, when I do Dylan's material, it's probably a lot easier for the average person to understand the lyrics. Bob doesn't make it easy for you uh, to understand, especially these days. Uh, he's he right; he's completely unintelligible on half of the stuff, and he's changed his songs around so much that it's just sort of like a a gathering <laughs> more than a concert. So anyway, I started doing it, and I started adding a few more songs, and I thought, well, this is good; people like it. I like it. I'm having fun. I wonder if I could do a whole record of of his material. So. At one point, I just sat down and went through all his records and picked out songs that I felt I could do. And, you know, for me to do a song, I have to somehow make it mine. Um, 
if you listen to the Dylan record, if Bob hadn't written those songs, I'm not talking about the lyrics, because I never could have come up with those lyrics, but the way the songs are structured, harmonically and rhythmically, it pretty much sounds like a, a Ben Sidron record. I mean, it's maybe a little more exotic in some ways. But I have this approach that I can apply to some music, and it, it works, and it doesn't work for everything. So I found the Bob Dylan material that I thought it worked for, and I made those arrangements. And I think the the real secret behind that record is I decided not to record it in the United States. That if I recorded it with musicians here, and actually I played some gigs here with great great groove musicians, and the the material was fantastic, but it sounded like just another Ben Sidron record to me. And I really wanted to get in a room with musicians who didn't have the same musical roots that I have, meaning this strong backbeat thing. I mean, everybody plays a backbeat these days, but you can't really get the total authentic American rhythm and blues groove without being in a studio or a room with Americans who have grown up on it. It's in the air. I mean, there are great players everywhere, but it's about this culture, really. And I, I didn't want it to be a groove record first and Dylan second. I really wanted it to be a Bob Dylan record. So anyway, thinking that a lot of what I got out of Bob Dylan's early records was this kind of haunted sense, like there were ghosts or something. It was like weird. There were, I never heard anything sound like that. The idea was to make it sound haunted not by any weird tricks, but just in some musical way. So we wound up recording it in a barn in the countryside of France <laughs> with musicians uh, from Switzerland and, 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 and uh, France, and uh, we did it in three days. It was a great experience. There's a video up on YouTube of, uh, oh, I think it's Highway 61 or something, which you can see the room where we recorded it, and you can see the, the musicians and how it was done. It was really done not just old-fashioned, but kind of in a way that people just don't make records. It was set up in a room. We kind of ate lunch in the same room. The control room was right next to the piano. Uh, and so all those things contributed to the thing sounding like itself. Mm. It didn't sound like a Bob Dylan record. It didn't, in the end, really sound like a Ben Sidron record. It sounded like a like a, a kind of a magical little record and i think uh, it's done very well what i mean by that is more many more than 10,000 people have heard it and i think that's why have you found that a lot over the years that the your surrounds and environment in which the, the record is being made can have a, a major influence on, on the feel and how it comes out well yeah you know uh, the the re the sound of the early uh Rudy Van Gelder Blue Note records, if you listen to those very early records, there, there's nothing to this day that sounds like that. They're so warm and so intimate and so present. Uh, and then if you turn them over and you look on the back of the jackets, the liner notes, you see there's Thelonious Monk and there's this lamp behind him. He's at the piano, right? And then you take a Bud Powell record and you turn it over. Oh, there's Bud Powell and there's the same lamp. <laughs> and then you get a Horace Silver record. And there's Horace Silver with that lamp. And you start to realize it's because of the space that these records all sounded the way they sounded. Yeah. Uh, and talking to Rudy Van Gelder years later, he said, absolutely. That was a living room. That was, a, that was the lamp, you know, <laughs> and the, the drums, they were down the hallway. And, that's, and so you don't just record the music, you record the space. Yeah. You absolutely record the space. Now, your son grew up to be a musician as well. Have you been forthcoming to him with career advice over the years, particularly when he was starting out? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I, I, I was very clear not to encourage him to be a musician or not to suggest that that's something he needed to do uh, because it's very difficult. And if you don't... I mean, I say if you have a choice, don't become a musician. If you have any choice at all, don't do it. Uh, because there are people out there who will eat your lunch <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> so uh, the first thing is I didn't encourage him. The second thing I did when it was obvious that he loved writing songs was encourage him to do that and to let him know that songwriting is the heart of this business. Nothing happens without a song. And being 
able to understand how a song comes together and what makes a song work uh, is, is a skill. It's a real craft. And uh, he, had, uh, he had a talent for that. So I always encouraged him that way. Uh, and then the other thing is I never uh, ever commented or criticized uh, how he played any instrument. He wound up playing every instrument, uh, drums, bass, guitar, piano, whatever. Uh, and I would play with him a lot when he played drums. I would play organ or piano or whatever. And that was the first way that we started playing music together. And uh, I decided never to comment on what he did. Uh, you know, normally, if you're playing with a, with a musician, uh, you tend, uh, to, well, first of all, hopefully you pick musicians to play with because of the way they play. But normally, uh, you might say to them, well, you know, Philly Joe Jones would do this there, or Steve Gadd would do this there, or whatever. But I never did that because I kept thinking, you know, if there's something unique about the way he plays or he's going to play, this is the time that it's got to develop. And so don't tell him anything, just play. So that's what I did, and that's what I didn't do. And he turned out to be a very competent, natural musician uh, who loves being in recording studios, even though the business is so different and it's a very difficult business to be in. He just loves it. And just before I let you go, Ben, you, you mentioned the book. Uh, what about musically? Anything in the pipeline there we can look forward to? Well, you know, after the Dylan record... Um, it kind of set me back. First of all, everybody said to me, well, you've got to do Volume 2, man. It's so great. Uh, but I can never do Volume 2. I, I just can't do it. It's, it's not why, why I do these things. Uh, I thought about, well, what about somebody else? What about uh, doing a collection of Randy Newman songs? Because I loved a lot of them. But, you know, that it, 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 I didn't want to do that. So uh, I, I kind of have to wait for the next idea to show up. Uh, I'm still playing. I mean, in November, I'm going back to uh, Europe for a month, and uh, I still play uh, in the States. Uh, and, um, you know, an idea it seems to show up every 18 months or two years. Uh, I'm not actively looking for anything, but uh, I'd be very surprised if in the next two years there wasn't another uh, record in the, in the works. And I suspect it's going to have something to do with spoken word. Mm -hmm. um, I, I very uh, often now will even just get up and stand up away from the piano and continue a song, and continue the song as if it's uh, part of a larger dialogue, um, and that the song is just sort of the hook, but the dialogue continues away from the piano. So I, I, I have a feeling something like that might be in the offing, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm waiting for it like you are, I suppose. <laughs> well, whatever, whatever it may be, I'm sure it'll be fascinating. We certainly look forward to the uh, the book project next year. Hey, Ben, thanks so much for your time. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to, to catch up with you. Congratulations on uh, such a wonderful, diverse career so far, and we're, we're sure uh, there's still plenty, plenty more on the road ahead. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much, and uh, big thanks to all my friends and, and, and fans in Australia. Fantastic. Take care. We'll catch up with you soon. Cheers. All the best. Bye-bye.